I think we're ready. Yeah. Good morning. I'm honored to introduce our Dharma speaker this morning. Reverend Grace Shearson began her Zen practice in 1966 under Shunru Suzuki Roshi at the San Francisco Zen Center. In 1985, she began practicing under Sojin Mel Weitzman Roshi at the Berkeley Zen Center, where she served as president from 92 until 1994. In 1995, she started her monastic training at Tassajara Zen Mountain Monastery, where she received Dharma transmission in 2005. In 2005, she also received Zen Master Accreditation in Japan and was a guest lecturer at Tokyo University Buddhist Studies. Grace has authored several books, including Zen Women, Beyond Tea Ladies, Iron Maidens, and Macho Masters, Zen Bridge, The Teachings of Hido Fukushima, and Naked in the Zendo, Uptight Zen, Wild Ass Zen, and Enlightenment Wherever You Are. I made it a point to order me naked in the Zendo immediately. It looked like a good read. Yes, I hope so. She has also published articles in Shambhala Sun, Buddha Dharma, and Tricycle magazines. She founded two practice centers and a retreat center under the Central Valley Zen Foundation. Professionally, Grace is a clinical psychologist with a PhD in clinical psychology from the Wright Institute at Berkeley. Her hobbies are horseback riding, bicycling, swimming, cross-country skiing. Uh, Grace is married with two grown sons and four grandchildren. Grace, we welcome you. Thank you. <clears throat> Am I ready to talk now? I don't want to yeah. jump ahead of any other procedures. <laughs> Usually I do. Um, well, I'm very happy to be here with you. I must tell you, I'm wearing the Rakasu. Well, if my dog will let me show you. Um, that was done for me by my teacher, Keido Fukushima at Tofukushima Monastery in Japan. So this is a little different than Soto. Um, it's bigger because it's Rinzai. And uh, I definitely had the samurai training there. So um, when I practiced in Japan, I recognized that what they were teaching was not the same as what we were doing and that we would never be able to do what they did in the same way. Um, it was amazing. And I also watched many young men come to Tofuguchi Monastery and try to do what the monks were doing and then crawl out of the Zendo afterwards. <laughs> it was very rigorous. So um, after that, I decided with some friends that our small sanghas were the root of the growth of Zen in the West. So we got together uh, a group of teachers who had small sanghas and we began training our students together at Shogaku Zen Institute. I need to, I had to write that down. I need to put in the pitch for Shogaku Zen Institute. When you go to Zen centers generally, and I don't know about Atlanta, but generally you learn how to ring the bells and take care of the altar and how to do the bows and how to do the chants. But I thought uh, we should teach people how to talk to uh, those who had addictions and who were having marriage problems and so on. So we began training people in some of the things that um, other priests in other traditions become trained in. And also during the course of that, um, I discovered that um, there were many, many cases of sexual misconduct in our tradition and many different temples. And it seemed to be um, part of the results of power 
and living in a patriarchy and having uh, men having power and seeing sexual relationships as part of their empowerment. So for some reason, I can't remember why, I became known to many women as someone who would fight for them if there was uh, sexual misconduct in their practice or in their sangha. And so I began working in that way. And I must say it had a big impact on my ability to practice in institutions because there were so many different cases and so it's only recently that I've come back around, of course, there was COVID too, to teaching again. And, um, but I have been, uh, through Shogaku, offering classes on preventing misconduct. And the preventing misconduct classes um, sometimes are sponsored. We sometimes get a grant for them. But I was working with Carol Murchison, an attorney who uh, would help people, uh, help people who had uh, an issue in their community understand what their legal rights were. Because um, based on the things I'm going to talk about, it's very hard for us um, to, uh, I would use the word police ourselves. We have a really hard time um, bringing uh the teachers to account for it usually what happens is the woman who was involved and i'm just going to speak about that side but even though there's the other side too of men being abused um usually the women leave and the teacher stays and is supported and even at my own uh home temple berkeley zen center I would talk to my teacher a lot about his attitude towards women because he had a feeling uh, that the way women uh, would become uh, committed to practice was through falling in love with their teacher. So there was a lot of energy in that direction of his affection, particularly for young women. <laughs> but I must say that the Sangha did not appreciate my efforts to uh, bring this to light. And uh, that's been part of why I've kind of been on my own for many years. One of the things that has um, been discouraging for me, it's not that I believe, and I've written some articles on this for psychoanalytic journals, it's not that there are a few rotten apples. That's not the problem. <clears throat> if there were just a few rotten apples, we'd pluck them out and move on. But the community has a very hard time um, uh, confronting the teacher. And the social uh, psychology, the dynamics, the group dynamics, make it really hard for someone to come forward, and, uh, and particularly a woman to come forward. So um, that has been the problem for me. The problem for me has been, it's not that we have a few rotten apples. It's that with all the emphasis on um, awareness and being present, it is very hard for people um, <clears throat> to look at this uh, aspect this um, dynamic of uh, having a guru or a teacher um, and the teacher uh, misbehaving in some way and being held accountable. So it's not for me that the teacher is the problem. The problem is why is it with all this awareness practice, we can't seem to bring this to light. And it just goes on and on. Um, my most recent experience of it was in a community here in California, which I'm not going to name. Uh, I've already been in front of a couple libel cases <laughs> for <laughs> naming these things. I had to hire an attorney at one point. Um, and I was vindicated because it's the truth and libel is about <laughs> when you're telling lies. So in any case, the, the latest one I was involved with was when a teacher 
who had repeatedly had um, women um, companions come out of his sangha, chose one. And then he was almost retired, but in fact, he was. He wasn't really teaching at the center anymore, but she was a little younger and she wanted to teach. So he convinced one of his Dharma brothers to give her Dharma transmission. And then they proceeded to push all the other guiding teachers out of the community. Hi, Molly. There's another person I know who's joined us. So um, when I tried to talk to some of the board members about what was going on, they said, well, we don't know who the victim is because the woman involved is very happy about this relationship. And I said, the victim is the Sangha. And um, that's been my latest experience with this, that the Sangha, by not confronting these problems of sexual misconduct, is the victim. Whether or not the, the um, survivors or the women who are preyed upon by a teacher um, find this to be an unhappy situation. It's the Sangha that suffers. There's a, a divisions of favoritism. There's people who support the teacher and people who say this isn't right. And so it, there are many ways that the Sangha suffers. So I've been teaching these courses to help people understand the dynamics that um, lead to uh, a, a community deteriorating some on the basis of uh, this kind of uh, sexual misconduct by the teacher. And as I said, the thing that was most discouraging to me was not uh, the teachers doing this. It's easy to see people being pulled into uh, cultural uh, myths of this is okay and I have power and therefore the women belong to me as we've seen throughout history. But the problem for me was that people who were practicing awareness couldn't see this. So the important thing for me is teaching people uh, who come into community to understand what are the dynamics that uh, lead to a community that cannot speak up when some, something goes wrong, who find their loyalty to the teacher or the community is stronger than their sense of justice. And so that's been something that has has bothered me. It's like our practice is about developing our awareness and our ability to see clearly and act clearly in our lives. And so I feel and what I'm going to talk about today is we need to develop, first of all, an awareness of what the dynamics are. You've noticed that I don't have a shaved head or even short hair anymore because I feel like this is part of a uniform. <laughs> and at first during COVID, it's like, well, what do I need to go for a haircut for? I'm going to minimize my contacts. But then I thought, well, why would I need to wear a uniform and demonstrate my commitment by shaving my head. This somehow started, I don't know, with the Buddha, but you know, men go bald, women don't. So why would I? So um, there are various things that signal to people power in a community. One of them is the shaved head. Another is the uniform of uh, what color rakasu are you wearing? <laughs> And, and various things that uh, signify power and that we need to be aware of this. And we need to be aware of the kind of um, social influences. For example, all of us are carrying the genes that um, evolved from tribal membership. People who were part of tribes in our ancestry um, 
survived. They survived because they cooperated and they came together. And so we're carrying those genes that um, were part of tribal membership. And because of that, we can sense that if we are not part of the community, we might not survive. And this is a threat that's deep in our brain somewhere that if we lose our place in the community, we won't survive. And so it becomes an existential crisis when um, some, something counter to integrity in the Sangha is occurring, that we have to choose between our own survival by belonging and being protected by this community or um, coming forward. So this is very difficult. So part that's part of the education that we give in um, preventing misconduct classes. But also, I've written a lot, particularly in this book, Naked in the Zendo, about awareness practice. Let's see if I can reach with this doggy here. Ah. It started, I don't know if some of you are aware of this series of books. Um, that Edo Francis Carney um, wanted. She felt that women weren't getting enough um, attention. So she put together uh, a publication, it's called uh, Temple Ground Press, and came out with a series of books. One of them was uh, this one, Seeds of Virtue, Seeds of Change. Also Zen Teachings in Challenging Times and the Eightfold Path and so on. So um, this is where I wrote an essay about awareness from the Zen cushion to everyday life. And from that essay, I developed this book to talk more about awareness and the development of awareness, because I feel like going into a practice without being aware of the dynamics and without allowing your own awareness to come to the surface is a little bit like a driverless car. So that's another subject I'd like to talk about is the driverless car, the self-driving car, which is what we are without an awareness practice. And we've seen what happens. Sometimes these self-driving cars just shut down. And that could happen during the trauma in the sarga. And sometimes they can't see uh, the curb. And they drive over on the sidewalk. So there's all kinds of problems with self-driving cars, as there are with us. Without an awareness practice um, for our body-mind equipment, for our vehicle, Without that awareness developing and consciously developing awareness, we are not practicing Zen so we can chant well and we can bow well. We are practicing to develop an awareness that will guide us through the difficult circumstances of our life. So how do we develop this awareness? First of all, I think we need to be in touch with it. And that's what happens often during meditation is that we sense there is something that is watching us think. You have to see how miraculous that is because mostly we're guided by our uh, thinking mind and making decisions. It's like, where are my shoes? And, you know, how do I get from A to B? And what appointments do I have today? But what is it that watches when we notice that we're getting stressed, for example, with all the appointments we have? What is that? This is quite something. And we could go through our whole lifetime, maybe not as said people, but one could go through a whole lifetime without really coming into contact with the awareness that surrounds our mind and can watch our mind and tell us 
what is going on uh, from a larger perspective. This awareness is vast, and I can't say that you increase your awareness. I could say you increase your relationship to it. In other words, you're more actively involved in being self-aware um, when uh, you engage it. So first of all, we have to discover it. We have to discover that there is such a thing that is observing our mind. Before, maybe before meditation, we would just think and we wouldn't notice when we were thinking or feeling. And now we can become aware. I'm worked up about this. I'm worked up about, uh, I'm anxious about giving a talk. I need to in some way work with that. Okay, so that's the first thing that we must do is to know that there is something that is aware of how we're thinking and what we're feeling. And that through meditation and practice together, we amplify our relationship to awareness. It becomes more vivid to us. And that is, how, is what I believe the actual purpose of our practice is, is to, when we're practicing, we're working on amplifying this sense of awareness. And the next step, um, and which is what I have divided the sections of this book, Naked in the Zendo, is about allowing that awareness to circulate in the body. And so things that we do, bowing and chanting and doing orioki together, amplifies our connectivity and our awareness. So it gets our, we have a stronger relationship to it. And finally, the final step of awareness is, for me, is just letting it run free in your life, trusting it, knowing when it's guiding you and letting it speak to you and allowing it to guide your life. So this is what I talk about in my book and, and what I think the purpose of our practice is. But I think just talking about awareness isn't as useful as um, having an exercise to, to experience it. So I'd like to do that now for just a couple minutes. So first of all, I want you to be aware of the space in front of your eyes. And then the space that surrounds your body. And now become aware of the space in the room in which you are sitting. And then what about the space that surrounds the building you're sitting in? Can you allow your awareness to expand to that space? How about awareness of the space of your neighborhood. Can you become aware of that space? And what about the space that surrounds all of us in its vastness. 
to the furthest reaches of the universe, can you allow your awareness to expand to the furthest reaches of space? Now, mix awareness and space. So this little exercise helps you to recognize the vibrancy of awareness in which we are all surrounded. And as we continue to develop this sense of our awareness in this universe and how vast it is, it's really what we're made of. And we need to connect with that. And this kind of uh, practice of awareness, which we do in Zazen, is an awareness practice. Oftentimes, it will signal us when our mind can't take in information, the body itself in which this awareness has circulated, we'll say, uh-oh, I remember I, I have done various jobs in my uh, lifetime. And while my husband was in graduate school before I got my own degree, I worked um, selling space in a weekly television uh, magazine or pamphlet and I would just go from business to business. And sometimes people would say, if you're selling something, don't come in here. And I would put my foot in the door and say, why? And then I would go in and make the sale. So this was my work. So now I have to sell Zen. But in any case, I remember once when I was in, I was, this was uh, in Massachusetts. My husband was at Harvard. And I went into one shop and when I opened the door, I heard the music from Deliverance. You know, the movie Deliverance. <laughs> and I did not go in. And this is how your awareness serves you. It's like you have a job to do, you're supposed to do this. And then all of a sudden, your body says, no, we're not going in there. <laughs> and um, I've had this experience many times, actually. When I worked as a psychologist, I remember once uh, that we would call this dumping of a patient that showed up at my clinic. And um, they didn't tell me much, but he had been somewhere at another clinic before, and then they sent him to the hospital I was working at. And I did not, for, my awareness told me, you do not want to go up to your office, which is on the second floor, away from mainstream where everyone else is. So we went to a little room, which was someone else's room, and I started to talk to him and I couldn't. I was just too uncomfortable with this young man in the room. So I said, you know what? I think we need to do a talk screen, check him for drugs. And I sent him on to the lab. And when the laboratory started to uh, take the blood, she had him open his hands. And in his hand was a razor blade that he was clutching. Now, I never saw it, but I could not be in the room with that person. And this is how our awareness serves us. And it also tells us when something is wrong in our community and we need to address it. I wish we had more 
ways of rehabilitating teachers, <laughs> but it seems like once the problems have occurred, uh, the teachers either move on to another community or they resign or something. But we need to be aware of how things feel and not just, um, you know, there are so many things in our practice of, um, for example, the idea of creating conflict in the Sangha is um, punishable in our uh, Buddhist mythology by terrible hell realm, right? And there are so many things like that that discourage us from coming forward. But uh, we have to be aware of ourselves and our fear of being excluded from the community and being willing to have that happen, as I had happened at my own community in Berkeley, that people did not want to support my concerns about this. And rather than supporting more inquiry into the teacher's behavior, it's like, would you just go away? <laughs> and you have to be willing for that to happen. But we need to help the communities recognize some of the difficulties, some of the, you know, wearing the robes, um, shaving the head, um, always following uh, the practice, some of the ways that discourage us from talking about things that we're concerned about. Because we feel we might be at a loss from we might lose our community. And as I said, in our in our body mind equipment as people who've evolved from tribes, this is very threatening to lose a community. We need that community to survive, or at least we did at one point in our uh, evolution. So um, this awareness practice is actually the basis of what we do. And when I practice in Japan, I practiced koans. Do you guys do koan in your community? You, Taya, no? Okay, I, I actually tried. My teacher in Japan authorized me to teach the koan that yeah. So I had a couple just to answer, we, we do, but it's not a formalized practice. I was never formally trained right. in that in that method, and so we don't pretend to do that. But we certainly uh, have dialogues around the koan systems. Certainly, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's one thing to study them, and it's another thing to do the practice. So um, the practice. Uh, is so intense in the Rinzai tradition in Japan, that's when I realized, okay, well, we're not doing the same thing <laughs> that they're doing. So it would be good if we developed ways of teaching Zen in the US that had more relevance to our culture. For example, when I was in Japan, the beatings of the monks was so severe um, that they would, uh, they had something that was akin to a baseball bat that they would hit them with on their shoulders. And it was so severe that they would get open wounds. And so then they, the method for the new monks was that the monitor would come with the stick and poke them. They had big belts and poke them in that belt and knock them over backwards. And this kind of practice is not what we're doing. So what what they're teaching the the young men that come into the practice places is coping with pain and hardship, physical pain. And that develops their trust in the practice. But for us, what our practice is about, in my view, mental pain. How do we accommodate our own 
uh, suffering and practice with that, our own mental suffering, which means that we have to look at ourselves. And as a psychologist, I look at the things that are troubling us deeply that will come out if we allow them. So that's always been my approach rather than the the physical pain and the hardship. How do we get honest with ourselves? But in terms of the koan practice um, and awareness, I um, was working with a teacher, I think, who was really um, one of the greatest koan masters on the planet, uh, Fukushima Roshi in, at Tofukuji. And when I came, I, I would have a koan, you know, um, what does Mu say when it meets another person? And you would walk in and sit down to do the koan practice. And while you didn't have an answer, before you came in the room, when you came in the room, he somehow made you aware of the answer. So this kind of communicable awareness practice is something that occurs at our Zen centers. And I know <clears throat> I tried when, after he authorized me to teach some of the koans with some of my students doing koan practice, but they only became very anxious, both of the two students that I was experimenting with. <laughs> they became so anxious, I said, this isn't working for us. And whatever was missing from the setting uh, didn't uh, translate. It didn't translate to our practice. So that's why I feel that um, we need to be in touch with our own mental um, function and our own suffering. For example, we find, um, at least I find, in much of my suffering is repetitive. And when I stop and stop blaming uh, everyone around me for what I'm feeling, I say, oh, I'm in the same place I was when I was, you know, five years old with my family dynamics. And so we repeat cycles that are in our body and we need to become aware of them. And this will help us as we become aware of our concerns, it will help us to have a healthier community. So um, just as self-driving cars are lacking the awareness to drive that vehicle and get to where it's going. I think that without a practice of developing a relationship to awareness, we can't um, develop the Zen we need to develop in, in the West. And it's not going to come to us in the same ways that it, there, that it did in the East, in, in Japan, in China, and so on. There are methods we can use that are similar, but we also need to develop our own methods. <clears throat> and when we teach the preventing misconduct course, we teach counsel practice so that the community has a way to communicate and to feel what's going on with other members. And in the council practice, uh, we develop a great sense of awareness of others, their suffering and their joys, and, and how we ourselves can share a community, a healthy community, by developing the relationship of the Sangha, not just the relationship to the teacher, but the relationship to each other. So I'm going to stop there and uh, see if you have any questions for me. We have a hand up from Ungan. Please. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, this, this is a very sensitive topic that you brought up. 
I'm almost afraid to ask a question mm -hmm. or fear of being labeled as some sort of sexual nut. Uh, so I really don't appreciate all the publicity about this. So my question anyway, get, get on with the question. Uh, <laughs> what is sexual conduct to start with? You know, if I give Lindy Morgan down there a hug, is that sexual? Is that banned? So, it, so what is sexual conduct? And and then what is sexual misconduct? Right. And finally, who the hell gets to decide what it is and who violates it? Who makes those definitions? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So here's the thing. I, I'm not sure who you were referring to giving a hug to. Lay it down on the bottom there. Okay. Yeah. It's not showing up on my screen. But in any case, if you hug her and you have a heart on, if you have an erection, that's different than giving her an embrace, a friendship. So one would be sexual and one would not. And our bodies generally communicate that. Now, what we've learned um, in terms of studying the hierarchy of these things is that there is no permission. There is no permission granted. It's not possible when there is unequal power. So if there is unequal power between two people, uh, a boss and an employee, a teacher and his student, for example, that person doesn't really give permission because of the overriding relationship of um, subservience, of either depending on this person for advancing in the community and your studies, or um, in the business world, um, feeling that if you don't um, say yes to the boss, then you're going to lose your job. So this is, this is um a, a question of of consent sexual conduct is about consent and misconduct is when consent cannot be granted so even if um a, a woman a, i'm going to use women for this student says yes i will have an affair with the teacher there's too much power dynamics going on and many things that even resemble family dynamics to really give consent so con consent is the key does that make sense to you or do you have another question oh that that certainly makes sense but just a little follow-up question it's like now we've expanded this to saying because of the environment there cannot be true consent who makes that decision about what i mean you get lost in in my corporate days i had a lady file a complaint against me i didn't even know who she was i had never was never aware of her being yeah and yet she thought i had leered at her and file a complaint now yeah. I still haven't gotten over that uh, but... I can hear that you haven't gotten over it and I can understand that you haven't gotten over it because it wasn't right and it wasn't fair however it's become actually the business world now is much more successful and much more intent on these issues of consent than our Buddhist world, which is behind, it's behind the times. But I, I don't know if your, uh, if the accusation of leering ever went anywhere. But um, these rules occur not for leering. I mean, I, I'll tell you when I was in business in what years were these? This was maybe in the 80s that I was in the business world when my husband was in graduate school. And I had my boss 
there was some negotiation about <clears throat> delivery of equipment. I worked for Xerox. There was some negotiation. And he said, well, I'd like you to give their equipment to so-and-so because she was going to have a hissy fit if she didn't get her equipment. And I was okay. So I said, well, fine, let's negotiate. I'll give her the equipment if you give me a five review, which is five out of five. Okay. <laughs> so we had to do a little swap here. So he said, well, I'll give you the five review if you sleep with me. And I said, I'll tell you what, you know, it was so normal for bosses in that era to say those kinds of things that I, I didn't even report it. I didn't even think anything of it. All I said to him was, I'll tell you what, I'll write the five review for you. Okay. And that, and that was how we resolved it. Now, that was a case of misconduct. I can't say about your leering because I wasn't there, but I imagine that would be a hard one. The, pardon the language. That would be a difficult situation to uh, assess. What was that look like? So the rules now are about um, asking, someone out for a social event or um, giving unwanted hugs or kisses that feel too tight. I mean, women can tell you that didn't feel right to me. And this was a situation at the Zen Center I practice at where I had a dozen women come to me and saying, I didn't want to hug. That's not who I want to be in the Zen community. And, and so it's about the experience, but I'm sorry that your, your intense look was interpreted as leering when you weren't aware of someone. Thank you very much. I'll let somebody else get in now. I could continue this all day. I bet you could. <laughs> Grace, we've, we've got three hands online, but we typically try to take turns with the uh, the Zindo, is there uh, Robert? Is there someone in in the building that would like to ask a question? Anyone want to ask a question? Uh, go ahead with the ones on the line for right now. Okay, I'm going to try to take these as they came up in order. Stephen, I think you were first. I think Sensei dropped out of the line. Um, in, in Bill's defense, I want to say that we shared a very small room and a single bar of soap when um, when he was um, getting his black robes. And I have nothing to complain about with respect to Bill. <laughs> so I would, I would make him okay on that. Yeah. The... Your talk raised several issues. Um, the one that was just a throwaway at the end was when you say, what what are self-driving cars like? And my response was that they're still in development and that we will arrive at a point where a self-driving car is going to be a lot better um, than the way that we do things now. Um, so will we go there? The question of Rinzai versus Soto is also another one that we don't need to deal with here is that I've, I've done Rinzai training, uh, I've done Soto, and I, I think the Rinzai was a necessary prelude to Soto for me. But on the question of sexual harassment, of course, the same thing comes up in universities and many of the same issues are there uh, that in advanced teaching, if you have graduate students or if you have honors students, that the relationship between the instructor, the supervisor, and the student is very intimate, or at least in my opinion, it should be very intimate. And it leads to, it, it frequently involves feelings of love and one of the things that I have noticed over the years is that my 
attitude has changed from when the age difference is smaller, this looks remarkably like a boyfriend girlfriend situation. And as I get older, I realize that I automatically switch to an avuncular uh, sort of love towards the students, which is, and then again, where, where Bill is putting things on the table, um, that there has been one particular occasion where, um, yes, one of my students was interested in having a relationship it actually came up within the interest of um, how, how do I sit in meditation. And I said that if I'm going to show you meditation, that immediately cuts out anything else that we might do. Um, and we wound up in a relationship. We both went to the department head and said we are in a relationship. Um, and that was acceptable in that context. And I didn't have any power over her except and it's a joke that we've heard many times and i suppose it shouldn't be a joke is that yes as a faculty member i can go in and change anybody's grade that i like um and nobody would actually do that i don't think so that there are the university situation also what i'm trying to say involves this teacher student relationship as does the zen situation stephen is there yes. a question in here somewhere <laughs> i was trying to think of one um do you see that i mean you've been you've been in academia you've been in you've been in therapy um yeah. do you, do, is are the lessons to be learned from academia and from therapy, are these applicable to the Zen situation? Absolutely. And as I say, the business world is ahead of us in defining these things. And I, I think it was Bill who asked about these things. This is new. It's been accepted for thousands of years that men in power get to have the women they want. And we're changing. And so there's a sensitivity, there's a not knowing, and all, all of these situations come up. As a therapist, I can tell you, my personal experience was, I had an instance when I was attracted to one of my patients. And the way I had awareness that I was attracted was that on the days, this is when I was much younger, of course, when the days that I saw that patient, I wore a shorter skirt. And I busted myself and I recognized it. And in fact, I anticipated because of my own feelings of sexuality with this patient that it was going to come up in our therapy. And so I, I had to ready myself. And so eventually that patient did say to me, do you find me attractive? And I said, it doesn't matter. You have daughters. There is a primary relationship here. And just as you have a relationship with your daughters, sexuality doesn't enter it. But I had to be prepared and I had to be aware <laughs> that these feelings were happening. And as we become aware and take responsibility, then we can adjust. But this is a big change. As one of my sons, who is the CEO says, we've had a great run as uh, white males for, you know, however many thousands of years. That run is over. That dominance needs to change for the world to change. And that's, what we're becoming aware of. So there are painful situations, there are mistakes made, there's projection on the part of women saying, well, you were, you know, leering at me and so on. Mistakes are made, but we are in the process of changing something that has been acceptable for many years. Thank you, Grace. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. You're generating a lot of questions this morning. So, I, I hope so. 
with, with that in mind, um, uh, I've got an intention to make sure everybody gets a chance to ask that question. So if you would, as you're asking, please just keep that in mind. Sangaku, I believe you were next. Uh, thanks, John. Dan Jocelyn. I, let me interrupt for a moment. I think you want to refer to the Zendo again to see if anybody anybody there wants to take a turn alternating, alternating. Right, right now, I think we're good, Sensei. Thank you. Back to Sangok here in uh, Falmouth, Massachusetts. Uh, my question it starts with just a construct that you put out there. And I'm, I'm talking about conduct, not misconduct or right conduct, but conduct. Conduct um, is the inner relationship between two people, generally. And um, it seems to me that as you went through the construct of awareness, uh, it is behooves us to realize that we just are interrelating and what is determined as appropriate or inappropriate, right or wrong, uh, is a joint effort. And if we cannot be aware, if we don't know, if we don't bear witness saying what I feel, and if we don't come to some kind of appropriate interaction, then we are lost. So my question is, how do we ensure that the communication between men and women in the Zendo have the right support from the um, people in the Zendo to have these kinds of conversations without a defensive and offensive team involved? Yes, well, thank you for your question. And um, I think that we can't do it without the offensive and the defensive developing. It will develop. But let's start. Um, I know Alan Sanaki in the 80s, and I bow to Alan now, who's on life support, and we're hoping he's going to come off. Um, he helped at uh, Buddhist Peace Fellowship uh, publish a pamphlet called Safe Harbor. And it's relevant today, it was in the 80s, but it's relevant today with discussions of relationships and rules, and we should educate ourselves and understand this is a highly charged topic, and let's understand the new rules <laughs> that we have about this where uh, uh, it would be inappropriate, and nowadays I would have reported that boss who said to me, yeah, well, I'll give you a five review if you sleep with me. Um, I didn't even think then that there was something that I needed to, it, it, it's kind of like brushing off flies. As a young woman, it was so common for this to occur that I didn't even think, okay, this isn't okay, but we need to communicate now that you should feel safe in your body from advances. And in fact, it was one of the things I felt for myself when I went to the Zen Center, that it was one of the few places I could be where I could, for example, walk in Kinhin with a group of men and not feel like I had to defend myself or look to see what was happening. On the other hand, sometimes we get a little ahead of ourselves in the Zendo. And we had um, sort of a conga line at Berkeley Zen Center where people were rubbing each other's back. And the man behind me let his hands drop a little bit <laughs> so that he was, I did have a waistline then. He was on my waist and feeling my hips, not rubbing my back. And we have to understand we have bodies. And so some of these practices we have to be careful with and um, understand that we have, we have these bodies, we have these impulses, how can we be safe? And we need to talk about it and we need to have 
for example, the safe harbor pamphlet is available. It's available online with many examples and um, explanations. So education to me is very important here. Thank you, Grace. Uh, anybody inside the Zendo? Uh, no, I just Robert? Asked me. No, no. Okay. On on my side, I've got Makuo next, and then Lindy, and then Molly. Makuo. I think Lindy is before me. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna let Lindy go before. Thank you, Makuo. Oh. Now I can't see the Reverend. Uh, where'd she go? I'm in one square. There I you see. are. <laughs> Zoom is always funny like that. Uh, yeah. Thank you for this talk. I, I, it's This is so important. And I have to just quickly relate. When I first uh, came on, I didn't have... Um, I didn't have my camera on because I'd just come out of the shower and I was truly naked in the Zendo. But what's even funnier is while I was booting everything up, I looked out the window and there was a gentleman making a, making off with some of my yard equipment. So I actually ran into the yard naked and retrieved my items from it. <laughs> so the, I was very aware of my neighborhood in that moment. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You, your awareness extended. <laughs> Um, I was a, uh, a Shambhala practitioner uh, years ago, and uh, prior to the, you know, the misconduct of the Sakyong being made public, um, I, in fact, was a victim of abuse from a teacher. And, you know, I kept it under wraps for a few years because I felt like, oh, this was my fault. Maybe I seduced him, da 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 da, -da. But when it finally came out, uh, it actually became an international Shambhala incident, and this person was removed ultimately from the organization. Uh, he he was a predator. This person was going many places, including women's prisons, and uh, women started raising their hand. Um, and what what I learned through that is 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 really to to think about the vulnerability of the student that walks in the door and falls in love with the teacher, regardless of, of gender. Um, when, you know, the student's in the position that somebody is bringing something to them that's so wonderful and so helpful and, and enriches their lives, it it's so easy to, you know, uh, become vulnerable to that person. Um, so I won't elaborate more on that, but but just to, just to kind of ask you, how do you, um, how do we support our, 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 you know, because I think, I think the, the onus of this rests on the teacher to understand their position, but uh, to flip it around for, for the young person, whether male or field, female, not even if it's a young person, but a person new to a Zendo, how do they, uh, how do they protect themselves from, you know, a, a, a person such as I encountered? Thank you. Um, you bring up another a dynamic, which is um, the love and vulnerability that's required when we enter this practice and practice with the teacher. And we are vulnerable and we're taught to be vulnerable. I remember uh, Suzuki Roshi's son, Huitsu Roshi, coming to Berkeley Zen Center and pointing to my teacher saying, your teacher is the Buddha. Accept this teacher as the Buddha. This is part of our practice. So again, the education of women and men about vulnerability and boundaries, healthy boundaries, there's that course. Um, it's very important, but it's also important. And this is one of the things that I discussed with my own teacher. The primary delusion of women is to be wanted and attractive and desired. That is the meaning in our lives. Whereas maybe the primary delusion for men is I want power and I want to be seen in this respected position. But for women, what we struggle with is this desire to be desired. And we need to know that about ourselves that we seek 
relationships based on being attractive and being desired and that that's power to us and so we may elicit sexual uh, feelings from our teacher based on that need that we have and as you say it doesn't matter if a woman strips naked and jumps on the teacher he still needs to say no it's like being a parent as i said to my patient you have daughters sexuality will not enter that relationship with your daughters you teachers need to be educated as to their own vulnerability and women need to be educated as to the delusion that we come to the situation with that i want to be desirable thank you grace uh, Makua, I think you're next, and then uh, Molly, and then Karola. Thank you. Thank you, um, Reverend. I, uh, I want to thank you for you slugging away at this <laughs> all these years. <laughs> and all the, <clears throat> all the changes that have come about from when you began your practice, I'm really appreciative um of that and i have been the recipient of all your hard work so i thank you so much um you know i have found that you know i bring when i first began sitting i brought my family dynamics into the sangha and i think everybody does you know and so we we have this closed group with all these family family dynamics and trauma trauma going on um and i think that it's hard for myself i can feel certain things going on but it's hard for me to pinpoint exactly what it is many times not just sexual but just other things um that could be disturbing to me or to someone else. And I don't know, I don't know, is it them? Is it me? Is it, I, I'm not always sure exactly what it is. Um, and I would, I want to know if your course is online, if that's available to take, for me to take that course. Um, because, uh, I think it would be very valuable. Thank you. Um, these are really difficult uh, relationships to sort out. I remember um, my teacher was actually, I think he was in the army or something during Korea, and he had that kind of um, macho thing going on and sometimes he was really cruel i i have a right left um, dysfunction in that putting on an okasa for me was torment and there were times he was so cruel about it and i would tell him i refuse to put on my okasa in the zendo with you watching me because of the way you're acting and then i would cry for hours because I was rejecting him and my father died when I was six and he was my daddy and I didn't want to lose him again, lose my daddy again. So that kind of conflict just went on. Now, I'd like to say that our course would resolve things on that kind of a personal level, but I don't think so. I think in that case, those complicated in the body uh, circuits, that get activated need to go to therapy. <laughs> and I highly recommend if, you know, it's a very intense situation being practicing Zen with a community and with a teacher. And many people will need to use therapy to untangle the knots so that we don't repeat the resolving of traumas from our childhood in that situation. So that's where I think that 
kind of not knowing. I know I'm in the grips of something, but I don't know what it is. I think that's where you take that situation. Yes, so. Molly, I believe you're next. Good morning, everyone from Boulder, Colorado, and thank you, Roshi Grace. Um, uh, and I can't see you now. I know. Isn't it interesting? I'm here. I'm here. I am over here. There you are. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, um, I, uh, huh. My my former teacher was. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your talk, but um, my former teacher uh, was one of the early and most notorious. Um, and it, uh, I was actually one of the the. I was the designated scapegoat. Speaking of family systems, <laughs> excuse me, I'm struggling with something here um and i i called i called it out to the sangha twice and was handed my hat yeah and had to do the whole re-entry into the the whole rigmarole which you know the formal uh pleading uh the third time uh <laughs> He actually left me standing at the ordination altar, is how, how I called it. He dumped me right there like four days before Tokudo, at which point I knew, okay, that's it. And I broke off all relationship, which brought up, thankfully, a very profound crisis, a crisis of faith. And I lost practice for almost a decade, working with another uh, female teacher off and on, but basically, um, yeah, not being able to come to practice. I'm very grateful to be able to come back, re-enter practice now. And in my current Sangha, there are a number of us who have come together, uh, having experienced this, this one teacher so we are Dharma brothers and sisters, having come out of that system. Thank you for your work around all of this. Uh, we reference you frequently. <laughs> we do. We do. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, something, as my, my question is, um, and something I've been thinking about, you were talking about this, this awareness. Uh, which we are not separate from. Uh, I've been wondering if there is a distinction, if you make a distinction between awareness, intuition, this bodily felt sense, and or field of mind, big mind, as Suzuki Roshi might have called it thank you okay. okay so the Tibetans are really clear on some things and they talk about the difference between essence of mind and contents of mind yes and I think that's a very helpful way to look at this. But I think awareness is bigger than intuition. Intuition is generally something perceived in the body. But I think awareness is is uh, vaster than that. It's everything. And so um, the all the descriptions that describe um, the situation in the mind, in the body, are applications of how awareness circulates in us and awakens us, but it's bigger. Field that of mind. Field of mind is still, we're talking about the mind versus when I was doing that exercise about awareness in yes. space, it's bigger. It's something we tap into in the mind. Yeah who we are yeah would you would you say I that say 
we're made of it, yes. And the, the stronger our relationship is to awareness, the clearer our lives will be. That's my feeling. Yeah. Molly, thank you for the question. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, everyone. Corolla. I also, also want to say something um, to Lindy that Carol Murchison, it was the attorney involved in Project Sunshine. And she and I were co-leading these classes together. So she and I both had had this experience um, of practicing and then having a community that welcomed misconduct and having to leave. And both of us were so, I know Carol is, is the same, it's very hard to practice with a group after that. Yeah. So to find a way to do that is important, which is I'm sort of just crawling back out now of uh, both COVID, I didn't have COVID, but just through the pandemic of isolating and also teaching these classes and coming into contact with so many people that it just was a trauma, what we call in psychology, vicarious traumatization makes it very hard for us to participate when this kind of thing goes on. Okay, now. Corolla. Hello. Uh, I very you. much appreciated what you started off saying about teaching leaders to have a more pastoral awareness because part of being the teacher is taking care of the Sangha. And I would like to point out that not only sexual predation, but its cousins, bullying, rejection, and belittling can be pro problems that, that drive people away from sanghas. And so it is really the responsibility of all of us to develop our awareness, not only of our own states and our own feelings, but to expand that, to look at the people next to us and the other people in the room, see who's uncomfortable, see who's unhappy, see who's in pain. And we can't fix everybody's problems all of the time. But if those problems are Sangha related, then it's incumbent upon each of us to get behind that person and speak up. Thank you for your teaching. Thank you, Carola, for bringing up these other elements. Um... You know, when Carol and I decided to teach these classes, we decided we had to focus on sexual misconduct. There are various, various ways that hierarchy it can be misused. And that's one of the reasons that, that we taught a council practice to try to bring everyone in to having a voice in the community because that does occur, and then someone, as Molly said, it is, I think it was Molly, that scapegoating occurs. And I was scapegoated in my community uh, because of my stance and because the teacher would publicly scapegoat me during discussions. And so it made it impossible for me to participate. And it was really the heartbreaking thing for me was not being supported by the Sangha in general, but mostly by the women. And what I recognize as a dynamic there is women, it, this is my opinion, women feel they've been shorted for so long. It's like, I want an opportunity. So if another woman drops out, that gives me more opportunity. So the, the hidden competition among women makes it sometimes so we don't get the support we need from other women. And one of the um, public cases that we covered in our class was what happened in Boston. And that is out on the internet. And um, the teacher resigned and was asked to leave and so on. But what happened was there were several very um, educated women in the Sangha who understood these dynamics and came to the support of what you would call the victim or the survivor of the relationship, the woman who was involved with the teacher and supported her to such an extent that she didn't have to leave the Sangha because in most cases, 
it's like the scarlet letter, right? It's like, oh, you were the one, you know, you seduce the teacher, you're the bad person, you're the one that's wrecking our community. And so they leave. And it's a really interesting case um, to read about um, the greater Boston Zen community and it's online in great detail, the dynamics of what happened there and how they resolved it. So uh, I would recommend that. You can also sometimes see an element of daddy likes me best. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the whole daddy thing. And by the way, teachers will play that one <laughs> with favorites. And we're all human. So then we have favorites. I, I saw it in myself when I had students that some were more favorable than others. <laughs> And you and really have to be aware to, of it. That is a way to maintain your power because you can, all your little favorites will support you if you're having some manner of dispute. Absolutely. Yeah. You have your little uh, group. In fact, um, I, uh, there was an ethics committee at some point in the community I was in with the teacher who kissed someone on the lips she said and he denied and um there was an ethics committee and i had the statements of I don't know, 12 women who said they were uncomfortable with hugs and kisses and so on they just wanted they want to be related to on a zen basis not as daddy's girl or as a girlfriend so i had these statements as a practice leader that I sent to the ethics committee and I had my teacher call me and tell me that I could not present those things. I was not allowed to because there was only one woman coming forward and the 12 women I had were irrelevant and I was not allowed. My teacher told me I was not allowed to bring that to the ethics committee and I said I will let the ethics committee decide whether they want this information or not. And then, uh, as Molly talked about being left at the uh, Tokudo altar, I was on the brink of transmission. And of course, that was the issue. Uh, after the ethics committee met and all this went on in the community, then I went to my teacher and said, OK, where are we? And he said, well, I don't know. I have a lot of doubts about you. <laughs> and I said, well, guess what? I have more doubts about you. And I, I went to another teacher. And at that point, I had been practicing for a long time. And it was clear that I was going to get transmission from one person or another. And that teacher advised me to do something in Buddhist lore, which is you ask three times for clarity on something. And so I I went back to my teacher and I said, OK, so um, what's the date of my transmission? And I was prepared to do that three times before I left. He gave me the date, the first call. Now, as one of my friends likes to, I, I forget the quote, maybe it was from Lyndon Johnson. You'd rather have people pissing uh, out in the tent, outside of the tent, than people pissing into the tent. And so I think I had the feeling at that point that my teacher did not want me to leave to go elsewhere because I was much freer to say things <laughs> from outside the tent than I was still staying connected. And I must say that it was a really wonderful relationship that I had with my teacher, which was, I don't think anyone fought as much as we did and stayed together. And so that was something that was really wonderful was that even though it tried to stop me from fighting and doing it publicly we stuck to each other and the reason we stuck to each other is every time i thought that's enough i can't take it anymore there's too many violations i would have a dream and in the dream we were connected and loving i said oh shit, i can't leave him yet so that was that was what kept us together. But even in our last meeting, when I talked about how much we fought, he said to me, I love you, Grace. And um, 
and then shortly after died. So not from saying that. (laughs) (laughs) So there are many, many, many problems that we have to work out with our teacher. And I always tell people, you know, bring, bring it, bring your whole self. Oh, Joe, I believe you're next in line. Thank you, John. Thank you, Grace, for such a wonderful talk. And I was, I did have a couple of comments or questions earlier, but when I saw so many people lining up, I decided to wait and get out of the way. And I'd really let, want Janice Procopio to go next. I, but I wanted to ask the room again in the Zendo, um, Keiko, anyone there have anything to say? Step forward and say, Anrak, don't be shy here. We're, we're looking very out of balance because nobody there is asking any questions. It's scary. As Bill said, you know, he might be labeled as some kind of sexual offender by bringing up the other side. Yeah. So, yeah. They're terrified of asking, saying anything about this because they know I'll come after them. <laughs> You're probably not as scary as the other women in the song. <laughs> right. So if nobody has anything there, I'll, I'll wait till after Janice makes her comment and I have a brief comment. Yeah, we do have one here. In the, uh, I do have a, in the... I have a quick one. I, just, I don't want to take too much time because uh, I know we're running late. But uh, so I remember a few, I don't know whether it was years ago. Um, at that time, I wasn't. Uh, practicing Buddhism of any kind. Um, I had, you know, I was in a different phase of life, but um, when the video came out of the Dalai Lama and that uh, that young boy, um, I was just, I didn't really know what to, I don't know how to explain it to anybody because all of my uh, friends knew that I had, you know, I had very high esteem of the uh, tradition of Buddhism and of the Dalai Lama uh, as being the head of one of those schools. And I guess it may be that I have some wrong, some misconceptions about um, maybe what self-realization looks like or what that means when you look at someone and say, you know, you're a guru or you're a, you know, a realized individual because in my heart i think that that means that you know not only are you someone who understands what it means to be but also that has to extend to other people and not only the person that you're interacting with but uh everybody in the in the sangha or i think in that it was a retreat so everybody in the retreat center even like how is yeah I just don't understand 100% how things like this happen when you say that there's a guru that um, committed any sort of misconduct that was harmful against somebody. Yes, it, it is a really, thank you for that question. It's a fundamental problem in that we feel that the field of enlightenment extends to psychological well-being and development and moral well-being and development, but it does not. Now, uh, the Dalai Lama was a wonderful example. We talked about it in the last class that I taught on preventing misconduct because it was current. And we wanted to talk about it. We wanted to explore it. And on the other side was it's the Dalai Lama. It isn't possible for him to do anything wrong because he is this realized guru. However, it was inappropriate because the child whose tongue he asked to suck or something like this was not Tibetan, did not have any understanding of this. Again, it was an issue of consent and explanation, clarity and context. And we should be able to say to the Dalai Lama, you have some things to learn here um, about, you know, your effusive affection and the boundaries of consent, context. Um, This child had no cultural context for this. Now, 
of course, as loyalists to the Tibetan tradition, <clears throat> they said, oh, it was one, the family said, oh, it was wonderful. But it probably was a, a little weird, at least a little weird for that child. And I don't know how that violation of the child's boundaries will affect him later in his life. So it's very important, to, <clears throat> you know, we've taken uh, practice and enlightenment as something that makes us perfect, but it does not. And once we have had some experience of realization, that's where my idea that now you are self-aware. Now you notice the things that you do. Now you question the things that you do. That's what the realization allows you to do, to create a space in which you can question yourself. And that's where the mental pain is. Oops, I did that again. Oops, I said something to somebody recently and I thought, oops. That came out of my mouth too fast. And we have to be able to question ourselves and not be beyond question because of our status or our experiences of realization. Thank you. Uh, Janice, is Janice still available? Uh. I think we've lost her. Grace, I'm going to slip one in of my own, if you don't okay. mind. Yeah. And, and you've touched on this in different ways. Uh, one, a part of my practice that I engage in and embrace is to try to communicate as fully as I can with those people typically I'm thinking one-on-one -on -one, uh, that I encounter uh, as the day goes by. A and, and I'm looking to you for a little bit of feedback, a comment here. I want to be as fully expressed to you and others as I possibly can be. Because if I show up being other than what I am, <laughs> you don't have the experience of what I am. You experience what I'm projecting or, or putting out there for you to consume. And I, I get that uh, we've got an environment here, whether it be business, sangha, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, male, female. I notice uh, I connect and enjoy uh, being in relationship, meaning I'm, I'm happily married, meaning outside of my marriage, having uh, women, particularly women friends, and those that are my age are much more relaxed and more free with fully transparent type communication. <laughs> they, they, they've been through as much as I have and they see through me and my transparency. Not so much, I'm a little guarded with the younger women. Uh, there seems to be this cultural, uh, environmental, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, a little bit of paranoia, like, you know. Is, you wariness, know, wariness of the patriarchy. Wariness of the patriarchy is power about to try to manipulate me or something. And I'm just wondering uh, what comes up for you when I tell you that when I encounter you, I want to fully express, be fully expressed mentally, emotionally, physically, give you as much of me as I can inside a uh, space of respect, love and and staying aware of our environment that we find ourselves in i say bring it <laughs> i say bring it but i am 
I'm not so self-conscious. I'm 77 years old, okay? So I'm living in Palm Springs now, which is a very large gay community. And recently I had a name tag on that was coming loose. And one of the gay men reached over right to my breast and put that, you know, rub that name tag on. And I was like, oh, great. And he said, oh, sorry, you know, and I said, no, it's fine. If you were straight, I might have other feelings. (laughs) On the other hand, at 77, it's like, oh, you want to touch me? Great. (laughs) But I'm not afraid of it. And I know when it's appropriate and when it's not. And at this age, it's and and as you say, more more women your age, you know, but it reminded me when you were talking of something Chris Rock said, this was a great line. He said, the difference between men and women, and this is what I think you need to be careful with. He said, when a guy meets your fiance, he says, I like a woman just like her. When a woman introduces another woman to her fiance, she says, I want him. Not I want one like him, but I want him. So there is a kind of competitiveness. And I find this not often, but occasionally with my female friends, they are a little bit too close to my husband. So you have (laughs) Be careful of that with your welcoming um, that you don't elicit some of that. In fact, I said to my husband the other night, we went to a movie, it's film festival time in Palm Springs. We went to a movie with a female friend whose husband was out of town. And she said, and we got out of the car and she kissed him. And I said, now why did she do that? <laughs> and he said, I have no idea. I didn't do it. I I didn't make her, but I I know that I have I have issues at times with women, and your wife may too, given your open arms to I, mean, I want to bring my whole self. So it's just something I wanted to mention because when Chris Rock made that joke about men, men say I want one like her, and women say to the other woman I want him, the competitiveness between women sometimes shows itself there there and i had that as a teacher with you leaving yeah i've got to go thanks again for being here thanks for bringing your difficult question to us i've I've got more (laughs) got more where those came from right so uh i found that as a female teacher that some of my students my women students would make put the moves on my husband as a way of you know putting me in my place and uh, and i had to make him aware of that because he was like he was like oh great friendship you know and it's like eh, eh. <laughs> no grace, grace I, I gotta share this i'll keep it under one minute uh, i was checking into a zen retreat And I was in a good mood as I walked down this old dormitory hallway. I noticed this older lady, uh, maybe late 70s, early 80s. And uh, she was carefully unpacking her little suitcase near the bunk bed that she had chosen in a room that had two beds. And I stopped and just out of the blue said to her, you need to know, I heard the front desk telling this young man that they were completely out of rooms, except there was a one spare bed, and I had noted her number in room 123 that uh, he might be able to occupy. Without a pause, she turned around and said, oh boy. Yeah, we we like a little bit of male attention. We become <laughs> invisible, you know. And by fifty, you're invisible, so it's great. We got a little male attention. It's nice. Okay, I guess we need to turn the uh, our Dharma talk back over to the room and let uh, this uh, session be finalized. Uh, you've had an amazing number of questions. We might have to ask you to come back for a part two. 
Would you be open to that? I am. I'm open. Thank you. Uh, Robert, are you still in the room? I am. I'm just behind the camera. Uh, okay. We normally end with the three vowels. So I hit three bells and we'll do the three vowels. Was and Tyune going to make a comment before? He had to go to the doctor. He he popped up a chat. Yeah, he had a doctor appointment for his lungs. Okay. Uh, all right, here we go. Beans are numberless. I them. gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The further way is unsurpassable. I vow to realize it. Beans are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The good way is unsurpassable. I vow to realize it. Beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them, to put it away as well as the charge for. I vow to realize it. Thank you very much, Reverend Grace. Are you welcome? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend Grace. Bye bye.